Okay. Yeah, I am Alex Bertheson, and check out that flow, a comparison study of FIC and phase contrast MRI in children with tetralogy of flow. Uh, to begin, I'd like to make some acknowledgments here. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge my great capstone mentor, Dr. Alex Barker, who runs the Advanced Imaging Lab at the Children's Hospital, and as well as Dr. Uh, Salcedo, who we all know and love. And then my third committee member, Michael Schaefer, who helped me with the protocol and helped me uh, formulate this project. And of course, the MHA program for uh, setting this up, I wouldn't be here presenting without them. So it's important to start off first with what is tetralogy of flow? Uh, it's a congenital cardiac malformation characterized by four main things we can see here, which is first of which is a ventricular septal defect, which allows deoxygenated blood to mix with oxygenated blood uh, between ventricles, followed by a overriding aorta, which you know, comes down more inferiorly during development, which takes blood from both uh, ventricles, which is a problem for getting oxygen throughout the body. And then we have a stenotic pulmonary valve here that is full of stenosis here. Um, and so the pulmonary outflow tract will shrink and uh, prevent blood from flowing fully. And then the right ventricle makes up for these problems by getting a right ventricular hypertrophy as you see is this thickened muscle. And this combination occurs actually more than you think. It occurs three in 10,000 births, makes about 10% of congenital heart disorders. And so uh, Children's Hospital of Colorado sees a lot of tetralogy flow patients. But it's all not doom and gloom, as we see here with Sean White. Uh, he actually was a patient here at Children's Hospital with tetralogy of flow that got repaired shortly after birth, and he went on to win uh, many Olympic gold medals. And so surgery is done um, in infancy to improve blood flow through the pulmonary tract, you know, the patch of VSD and to widen the pulmonary artery. And many problems can occur post-surgery, including pulmonary stenosis here, uh, cyanosis, which is lack of oxygen to tissues, uh, critical pulmonary stenosis, and sudden cardiac death. Uh, and so it's important for pulmonary flow hemodynamics to be analyzed and stress tests to be done through adulthood uh, for the cardiologist to understand and treat the patient fully to uh, if they might need anything uh, repaired. And so this is something cool we were able to do in the lab here at Children's. This is a 4D flow image of a uh, repair tetralogy of flow patient. As we see here, we have uh, a lot of tortuous flow here, and it's not going straight out of the pulmonary trunk along this pulmonary regurgitation that's jetting back into the right ventricle, along with enlarged pulmonary trunk, uh, which could be a chance for aneurysm there. So this leads to the capstone rationale. You know, physicians, providers need accurate methods to measure pulmonary flow hemodynamics post-surgery. So we need an accurate uh, way to measure flow, which is QP, which leads to our pulmonary vascular resistance measurement, which really informs physicians uh, on treatment. Uh, and so right, right now, in the thick principle is the most widely used method, and we'll get to that on the next slide, and that's in the cath lab. Uh, it's more invasive, uh, less, it's more time consuming, and these children are to go through uh, under anesthesia as they're very young. And it relies on ac accurate oxygen consumption uh, values, which is only set for adults and pretty poor for children. And so uh, previous studies such as Schaefer et al. found that PCMRI may be the gold standard. They found that there was vast differences between PCMRI and FIC in children with pulmonary hypertension. So a comparison study is needed, which leads us to hypothesize hypothesis that significant differences will exist between FIC and phase contrast MRI in these children. And so methods we might be unfamiliar with. On the left is PCR MRI, which we can collect from the physician at the hospital. And we're able to get these nice velocity images here and draw a nice region of interest around the main pulmonary artery, which uses different kind of aspects of machine learning to grab all the vessel walls and make this nice flow waveform graph here. Uh, we can easily collect cardiac index from this graph, which will give us uh, the values we need uh, for flow, and it'll also tell us regurgitation fraction. Versus the method that is mainly used right now, but more invasive, is FIC, which is where I collected data from EPIC online, from previous cath labs that cardiologists have done. And so what happens is they feed a catheter up one of the femoral arteries and veins and feeds it all the way to the pulmonary system, here as we see it, it collects partial pressures, oxygen concentrations, and results in this FIC equation here, which will uh, allow us to get cardiac output. And it compares arterial venous blood, and, or, sorry, arterial and venous blood to get a nice cardiac output. And so this has, leads to our results here, and there's uh, poor correlation and large variability between phase contrast MRI and FIC. Now this graph may look difficult, um, but it's a simple Bland-Altman plot that really looks at, compares two metrics measuring the same thing. 
And so the metrics of PC, MRI, and FIC are, are taken on the mean, on the x-axis, and on the y is the difference between the two metrics. Uh, each dot represents a patient, and this should line up perfectly along this mean here if there are the same data points. And in fact, we have three data points outside our upper and lower agreements showing even bigger dif uh, difference between the two. And here's a simple bar graph showing the large differences uh, in flow here, uh, excuse me, flow here, and then um, pulmonary vascular resistance here. Uh, they should line up perfectly with each other. This is another way of stating it. Uh, there's poor correlation along this line, R squared of 0.15, uh, there's a poor correlation. So this came to us coming with the idea that maybe we should sub separate into two sub-cohorts based on regurgitation fraction. Uh, in a normal patient, it should be around you know, zero one with no underlying diseases, but in these patients, we found a median of 40% regurgitant. And so you see here, a transannular patch is often dumb in the pulmonary trunk, and this causes pulmonary stenosis and large regurgitation. So this graph is simply saying here, patients with larger uh, than 40% regurgitation fraction you know, results in a larger difference between FIC and PCMRI compared to uh, these patients here that lower than 40% have less differences. Uh, and so this should be known in the clinic as FIC relies on, uh, it doesn't get to count for regurgitation. And so to summarize, uh, FIC and PCMRI uh, MRI methods result in uh, significantly different hemodynamic data and children's tetralogy flow, uh, which we found p-values that were significant for all of this data. Uh, this gives physicians inaccurate data to properly treat their patients. They need accurate flow and pulmonary vascular resistance to understand their patients. And uh, high IRF values hinder proper cath metrics and visualizing the differences we've seen. And so basically, pre previous research has shown PCMRI to be the gold standard based on its acquisition time, high internal validity, and its non-invasiveness. And lastly, future directions, uh, I'd like this to be a larger cohort study. We're planning on getting this published and to combine, uh, maybe uh, look at combination of CAT and PCMRI to see how that data results. And, and lastly, this is 4D flow versus 2D flow and what kind of results that might end in. Uh, thank you, and questions, if we have time. Thanks very much, Alex. Thanks. That was a great talk. Yeah, great job, Alex. Um, so if you do have any questions, uh, please submit them into the chat box. Um, so it looks like the first question is, what was the number of patients? Yeah, so we had 35 patients. I didn't include that data on the slide as I was running a little short. Uh, we had 35 total patients uh, that had PCMRI taken and uh, FIC taken within five months of each other, uh, which we figured that would be um, very accurate data still. And so uh, we have an equal number of male and female. So we don't, but we don't think uh, that played any role in the differences we saw. Um, let's see, another question, uh, which germ cell population is the underlying cause of tetralogy of flow? <laughs> uh, that is neural crest malformation uh, during the radical pulmonary segmentation falling down the pulmonary trunk and the aorta, a, aorta trunk. So proper neurocrest cell failure. Excellent. Uh, that was a question from Dr. Lee. Uh, so why should the, <laughs> another question we have is, why should the catheter be continued, uh, should, why should the catheter be continued to be used? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I'm, that's something I'd like to fully look into and talk to the cardiologist. It's still widely used because with adult populations, it's proven to be pretty accurate. Uh, they use these tables called the FARGE tables that estimate oxygen consumption, which is uh, doesn't account for children underneath of three under anesthesia. And so they're, and they might be used to the adult population using it and it's something they become used to and easy for them. And it's also um, might be a good money maker for the hospital as well to uh, you know, use the cath lab. Um, and so there's been some pushback, but hopefully these studies will allow for more post-processing and MRI use in the hospitals. Okay, thank you. Uh, looks like that's all of the questions. So we'll go ahead and move on to the next presentation. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, everyone.